Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Me and my wife set out to go on an overnight camping trip in the country. I go hiking and camping fairly often, and my wife sometimes accompanies me out on my outings. This time, we went about 30 miles southeast from where we live in Nagadoches to some remote family-owned land. Our land is on a small blacktop county road, and few people live there. Only one neighbor lived close by, an old woman across the road. The road parallels Sam Rayburn Reservoir for several miles and is a short distance from it at this point. It was late afternoon when we arrived there. Wildlife are plentiful in this area with deer, bobcat, and hogs. And since I occasionally would hunt deer there, I put out some corn for them to get ready for the season, and then we set up our camp. We have a small storage building that family and friends use to sleep in on our hunting and camping outings. After we were set up for the night, I started a fire about five yards away from the building to roast hot dogs on. It was beginning to get dark at this time. We have a camcorder that we always take on our trip, and I filmed the outing. I remembered that as it had gotten dark, dogs could be heard across the nearby road barking like crazy. Up to this point, I filmed everything, but since I was getting hungry, I stopped to make me some supper. My wife was sitting down on a makeshift chair, and I was at the fire. Suddenly, a loud howl or hoot came from the nearby creek bottom, a distance of about 70 yards. It was very loud and sounded almost baboon-like, but also much like a human's vocal cords. We were both shocked by the piercing sound, but before we could react, whatever it was came to within approximately eight yards and screamed again. My wife jumped from her chair sideways and ran to the little shed, spraining her ankle in the process. I didn't know what the sounds were, but I'm sure they were not deers, hogs, or hoot owls, or anything else that I've ever heard. I could not be sure if it was not some prankster, although someone would risk getting shot coming to a person's camp at night like that. I ran to the shed to get my pistol, which I always carried on our outings. All the while, the animal screamed the same sound in rapid succession about seven times in all. The sound emanated from behind a pile of tree limbs placed there on the previous outing. I went to the edge of our camp and shined my flashlight into and around the pile and held my pistol ready, but no more sounds were heard. I couldn't see any eyes shining in my flashlight beam either. Even though we were a little unnerved by this event, I planned to go ahead and make our beds for the night, but my wife's ankle was beginning to swell and she was in pain, so we packed our things and went back home. I've gone back a few times since then, but have not noticed anything strange. So if it wasn't a Bigfoot, fine. I just don't really know what it was. All the experienced outdoorsmen I have talked to and about the sounds say they have never heard anything like them either. Dogs from across the road were barking like crazy for about an hour up to the time the sounds were heard. The barking was in the direction that the hollering sound began from. It was around seven o'clock and it was clear and cool. The area is typical of eastern Texas with dense forest and creek bottoms. Sam Rayburn Reservoir is within walking distance through the forest from the site. A small pond is on our land as well. The screams or hollers came from behind the dam of the pond where runoff flows through a creek bottom. The terrain is somewhat hilly in this area. There is a mixture of pine and hardwood forest on our property. Some areas surrounding this land have been partially clear-cut in recent years. Me and my wife were the only ones involved. 
We were cooking hot dogs on an open fire. On to the next one. At around 11.25 a.m., a hunter near the Sulphur River in Delta County was in a thicket waiting for his brother to show up. The brother was late, so he was eating the cookies that he had packed for him. All of a sudden, the cattle behind him and the other part of the herd across the other side of the pasture stampeded to the center of the pasture. The cattle all met in the center of the field and stampeded off to the south together. The boy had not startled them as they were used to him. He went to turn around to see what had stampeded them and looked over his left shoulder and saw something walking on the far west fence line heading northward. It stopped twice and looked in his direction. An icy feeling shot through the boy's legs. The six-strand barbed wire fence only came up to its thigh or butt area. It must have been eight and a half feet to nine feet tall, solid black, and covered the ground in a way that he had never seen. If it was a man, it had to be a good jumper. The boy's brother showed up a half an hour later. On to the next one. Hello, my name is Bill, and I had an uncomfortable interaction with a Sasquatch while I was fly fishing in Montana. I'm retired now, but back when I was working, I was allowed four weeks of paid leave each year. It was customary for me to use one of those weeks on fly fishing excursions, and I would always do it solo because I realized at a young age that it was the most efficient way for me to clear my head. My wife was always very supportive of it, because she also believed that it helped me to be less grumpy. I was about halfway through the week-long getaway and was doing some early morning fishing when I noticed something out of my peripheral. The thing stood maybe 70 yards downstream from me, and at first I thought it was a very tall guy who was wearing mud-covered clothing initially. It didn't seem to pay any attention to me as it reached its hands into the water and pulled a few things out to feed on. I'm still unsure as to what it was taking from the water, but I could see that it wasn't fish. After watching it for a few seconds, I began to smell a nasty odor that I believe in having comes from the creature. The smell reminded me of a homeless man who hadn't showered in weeks or even months, and it seemed to grow worse by the second. The more I thought about it, the more I realized it didn't make a whole lot of sense for a homeless guy to have traveled out to that desolate location. Unless the man was highly skilled at surviving in the wilderness, he would never make it out there. I then noticed that the movements of the man were quite wild, even animalistic. Something about it all seemed so out of the ordinary. I became so confused by what I was looking at. The fact that I had no previous interest in Bigfoot or Sasquatch didn't exactly help the situation. Truly, I didn't have the slightest clue about what was standing in that river, as I knew the shape of the figure to be far different than that of a bear. If it hadn't been for the distance and the fact that I have poor eyesight, I would have right away seen that it was no human that had walked into the river. The sun was glaring at the time of this encounter. Combining that with my lack of vision made it even more difficult to perceive much detail on the guy from where I stood. Out of sheer curiosity, I walked around a bit, adjusting my position so that I could get an improved view. I assumed that the sound of the river would have muffled the sound of me trudging through the water, but the figure suddenly turned in my direction. Something about its body language implied that I should not dare to come any closer. I got the hint and turned to walk further up the river, and that was when I heard the terrible howl. I used the word howl, but I get what people mean when they say these things scream like a wounded woman only with ten times the volume. 
The noise was so aggressive that I thought it was for sure about to chase after me. But when I looked over my shoulder, the thing was still in the same place and staring directly at me. I remained in the knee-deep water as I slowly walked away. I had this feeling that if I went on to land, it would come after me in a heartbeat. It seemed far wiser to remain in the water and walk against the current. After I took a few more steps, I turned around to check on the creature's whereabouts, but it was gone. I was able to take my first big deep breath because I thought I was in the clear. As I turned around to resume my walk upstream, I saw the creature at 10 o'clock, standing on the ground near the edge of the water. The way it stared at me still makes me quiver. It just had such a blank stare, leaving me without any clue as to what its intentions were. I didn't know what else to do other than stay put, awkwardly standing there with my fishing pole in hand. I remember feeling like I would do anything to get out of that situation, to disappear from that area and teleport into my favorite chair in my living room. I can't tell you how long I stood there, but soon a man-made noise entered the vicinity. I saw the creature look up in the sky as a helicopter came into view. I couldn't tell who the helicopter belonged to, but it didn't look to be one affiliated with military or law enforcement. Still, the appearance of the aircraft was enough to persuade the creature to head for cover. It made me wonder whether it was merely trying to hide from additional eyes or if it had confrontations with people inside helicopters in the past. Since my exit out of the area was in the opposite direction of the section of the woods that the creature ran into, I speculated if I should head out of the water and make a run for it. Before I knew it, the helicopter was already at the horizon. Yet, I was still in the water, internally debating how I should proceed. Eventually, I concluded that waiting in the water to see if the creature returned was probably the worst idea. Sure, someone might have come down the river in a boat, but there was no guarantee of that. I thought the best thing I could do was to walk toward the path as quietly and calmly as possible. As I got on the trail, I would casually look over my shoulder every once in a while, hoping to reassure myself that the creature wasn't following me. The moment that I stepped into my rental car and locked the doors was quite possibly the most soothing moment of my life. I took a few glorious moments to thank the Lord for not only helping me make it to the car safely, but for sending the helicopter to deter the creature from pursuing me. I was in such an isolated location that my rental car was the only one in the parking area. As I began to drive out of the lot and toward the road, I checked the rearview mirror and saw a face watching me from within the edge of the forest. I have no way of knowing with certainty but I'm confident it was the same creature from earlier. Like so many others, I long for an explanation for what these things are. Are they more human or are they more ape? I think they're some kind of wild man. The reason they're so big and bulky is probably due to the harsh environment they have to survive in. It might not even be a thing of evolution. Maybe God put the species on this earth like he did with all the other organisms. I have to agree that there is something so very off-putting about them. It's like they're from an entirely separate universe. Heck, if I had had that disturbing experience, I would have never guessed something like it was out there. I dearly hope that we will one day receive an official explanation for what they are and why they're here. On to the next one. Hi all, I'm Leslie, and I had a traumatic experience with a few members of the Bigfoot species while paddling around in a lake in Vermont. I can't even remember the name of the lake as I went along on a trip with my best friend's family. The following report took place 16 years ago. I was 17 and lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the time. 
my friend Jasmine and I were only a couple of weeks away from beginning our senior year in high school, and her family offered to take us on our final end of summer trip before it started getting a lot cooler outside. A crazy part about all of this is this was how Jasmine's 13-year-old brother Duncan started talking about Bigfoot while we were in the car on our way to the vacation house. That was when their mom mentioned how there were rumors about Bigfoot having been spotted in the area. However, the tone of her voice made it quite clear that she thought it was a bunch of baloney. I'm almost certain it was the first night we were there that we put the TV on mute so we could listen to these odd noises that echoed across the lake. I remember them sounding like they were coming from the opposite shore, which had to be at least a couple of miles away. None of us knew what to label them as at the time, but I'd later come to learn that the appropriate term is whoops. It truly did sound like a bunch of monkeys were hollering from the other side of that lake. Even though the noise stumped Jasmine's parents, they ultimately concluded that there was a reasonable explanation. To them, Bigfoot was anything but a reality. Because of the parents' disregard for the topic, I was able to move on without giving it too much thought. A couple of days later, Jasmine, Duncan, and I decided to take an inflatable boat out onto the lake. Duncan wasn't able to swim, but for whatever reason, he decided not to wear a life vest. He loved to splash around in knee-high water, but never went past that. Even if he was wearing something that would keep him floating at the surface, it was close to evening hours because I remember the mosquitoes were really bad, which only agitated the situation that was about to unfold. We had been out on the water for maybe 30 minutes. When we began to paddle back toward land, I'll never forget how the trees just beyond the rocky shore were shaking. It started as a very soft vibration, but soon transitioned into violent shaking. Then we began to hear these very animalistic grunts coming from multiple spots behind the edge of the forest. I was initially inclined to believe it was Jasmine's parents just trying to have some fun by scaring us, but there were only two of them. But definitely more than two individuals making the grunting noises. By this point, we had stopped paddling toward the lakeshore as we were all a bit mystified as to what was going on. Those grunts turned to the sound of children laughing, only there was something very off about the noise that I can't even think of how to describe. I suppose it just sounded more like someone trying to mimic the noise of children. While the three of us tried to spot anything within the darkness of those trees, Duncan suddenly cried out, How? His hands were covering his right cheek while he winced in pain. What is it? Jasmine said, concerned for her brother. She forcefully moved his hands away from his cheek to find little drops of blood running down his face. Something had been lodged into his skin. It then sounded like it was drizzling, but the clear sky above indicated otherwise. I felt a sting in my upper arm. It was so gosh darn painful. It was like someone had shot me. A small stone, a bit larger than a pebble, had found its way past the surface of my skin. Get away from us, Jasmine yelled out, still suspecting that it was children who were throwing rocks at us. I had a bad feeling, like there was something else out there, even though I wasn't exactly thinking about Bigfoot. If anything, I think I was suspecting something paranormal, like demons or ghosts or something along those lines. The small stones didn't stop flying towards us, so we all took cover by curling up on the floor of the boat. The three of us hysterically screamed for help, and I felt the sting of another rock graze my back. It wasn't long after that that the boat started to sink. It had been punctured in multiple areas and was quickly losing air. The notion that Duncan couldn't swim made the whole situation even more alarming. I can't say when exactly it was, but the lack of little splashes in the water around us indicated that the rock throwing had stopped. When I lifted my head just enough so I could see past the edge of the boat, I was blown away by what I saw. 
even though I'm almost certain there were more of them, two bodybuilder looking creatures stood on the shore. Their faces reminded me of gorillas. After I returned my head to the floor of the deflating boat, it wasn't long before I heard the voice of Jasmine and Duncan's father calling out to us. What's going on? He said with a somewhat casual tone. I think he was assuming that we must have been horsing around and that there probably wasn't much to worry about. But I guess he soon saw that the boat was deflating, and since he knew Duncan couldn't swim, he took off his shoes and ran into the water. As he pulled the boat to shore, I was so worried that he would be pelted in the face with a rock, but the creatures seemed to have left the area. When we got to the shore, their dad saw Duncan's wound on his cheek and started interrogating Jasmine as to what had happened. When I said that these animals were throwing rocks from the shore, he looked at me like I was a lunatic. It turned out that neither Duncan nor Jasmine had lifted their heads to see what was out there. Understandably, they were too afraid of getting hit in the face with another stone. Once we made our way inside, I explained everything that I had seen. Unsurprisingly, the parents still wouldn't believe me. They were convinced it had to be some local children that had gotten carried away. So, even with the noises we had heard earlier in the week, Duncan's injury and my statement, they still refused to believe that Bigfoot were around the area. I think that's a perfect example of all the stubborn know-it-alls attitude that exists out there. That incident taught me that most humans, if not all, know so very little about the things that are in our world. Ever since that terrifying experience, I've opened my mind to the possibility of almost anything, even UFO abductions. It makes you wonder if there are real organizations out there, like the Men in Black. If so, can you imagine what a career like that would entail? I'll never forget the day I learned that Bigfoot is a real creature. I'm proud to share my story today. On to the next one. I was just eight years old. My family and I had a home on top of a mountain in Floyd County in the northern part of Georgia. Our land backed up to the boundary between Bartow and Floyd counties. It's a warm night in September, only a few days after my birthday, and the weather is perfect. My grandfather enters into the room where I am playing Call of Duty on my Wii and asks if I can take the garbage out before it gets too cold. I'm all the way up in my room. I nod and confirm this before pausing the game to put my shoes on. I unlock the garage door and go out into the garage before throwing the bag into the pickup that belonged to my grandfather. I go to my grandfather's pickup after turning on the light that is mounted on the exterior of the garage. At the time, I was only eight years old and I was terrified of the dark. As a result, I sort of rushed along and threw the bag in and prayed that I would make it. I was unable to reach there in time, and I hear the bag hitting the ground behind the vehicle. For some reason, my head begins to droop and my heart starts pounding, and I have this feeling that if I walk behind the truck, something will grab me. It's like the paranoia that kids get when they're eight years old. Therefore, I dash to the rear of the vehicle, grab the bag, and hurl it inside before reversing course to go back into the garage when I see something. My driveway is the kind that branches off a dirt road, then makes a sharp bend to the left and ascends a hill. The slope begins to lessen in steepness, but does not become totally horizontal. At the point in the slope where it begins to level out, I can make out a shadowy person simply standing there. Within the light that is emanating from the garage, I can just about make out the outline of what it is. At first glance, it seems to be a human, yet when my eyes adapt to the brightness of the object, I can now make out what looks to be hair covering its whole body. I am paralyzed with dread as I stand there, and it seems as if if I were to turn my back on it, it would run up behind me and catch me. As a result, I cautiously go backwards toward the garage while keeping an eye on it, and it appears 
that it follows me step for step as I move. I eventually make it to the opening in the wall that houses the garage door and dash inside as quickly as I can. As soon as I enter through the front door, I dash into the living room to greet my grandfather and exclaim, Grandpa, get the rifle ready. There's something large and it's walking on two feet in the driveway. I've no idea what it is, but it gives me the creeps. So, my grandfather gets his rifle and we walk outside on the front porch, which is perhaps 40 yards closer to the portion of the hill where I saw it. But it's not there. My grandfather responds, You sure you saw something? I don't say anything. I simply nod. He then disarms himself by removing the rifle from his shoulder and saying, Come on. You still have not replaced the trash in the garbage container with a fresh one. We exit the building together after simultaneously turning around. Nothing else takes place throughout the course of the next several hours up until almost 1 a.m. I've just woken up from a dream in which I've witnessed what really happened. I'm lying in bed and looking out the curtained window of my home where I can see that the light on my front porch is on. Because it serves as a kind of nightlight for me, I feel more secure when I do that. So I'm lying there staring at my window when I saw a big shadow walk directly in front of my glass on the outside. And when I say large, I mean gigantic. The window was about two feet above the ground, approximately four feet tall, and then about two and a half feet from the ceiling. So when I saw the shadow, I was startled. And since this shadow was so tall, it projected a shadow that was sufficiently large to give the impression that someone was dragging a wall in front of the window. I was able to listen to the planks on the front porch cracking and could see how broad this structure was when seen from the side. Whatever it was, this had a width of at least two feet when seen from the side. And it was humongous to say the least. I didn't want to go fetch my grandparents because I didn't want them to be angry with me for waking them up at one in the morning, especially when there was nothing for them to see when they came out. So I just sat there and watched this creature stroll back and forth through my window for a while, and then I went back to sleep before too long. Now, fast forward to the summer break between my sophomore and junior years of high school. Although I had relocated down the mountain, I continued my education at the same institution. Anyway, about a week before the end of the school year, my closest buddy, Kevin, and I had the notion that it could be a good idea to go up to the mountain and look for it to see if we could locate it. I did not have any second thoughts before seizing the chance and exclaiming, heck yeah, let's go. Therefore, the next weekend, when school had finished, I made plans to meet up with him and we both packed up some items necessary for camping along with some food and a 30 6 I informed him that we can set up camp at the home where I saw this creature, and he agreed that it is the ideal location to begin our search. So, we make it through the day, and when it's time for night, he says, Yo, let's go out and wander around. I tell him that's okay, and we both exit the tent. Almost immediately, I had the impression that someone was watching me. As I raised the gun to my shoulder, I could feel the excitement coursing through my veins. After placing his hand on the barrel of the rifle, Kevin brings the business end down to the ground. Please don't do it, since it will make me anxious. Therefore, we decide to begin exploring the forest by foot. Along the way, we come across a few narrow game pathways and hear a few noises but we do not discover anything. When we glance at each other, we've come to the conclusion that it's not worth it, and we then begin the journey back to the tent, which is going to take at least half an hour. As we make our way back through the woods, we can hear sounds that remind us of knocks and whoops. We have traveled approximately 100 yards away from the property where we have been camping when all of a sudden, a rock flies through the trees and lands within 10 feet of me and Kevin. After that, it seems as though it just unloaded on us, as rocks are landing all around us with not much time in between each impact. We can make out a variety of hoots and hollers 
coming from a variety of directions, giving us the impression we are being encircled. I yell at Kevin to start running, and I follow closely after him. As a result, we begin to rush toward the property, and as we do so, we hear the sound of branches breaking behind us. I pause for an instant before raising the rifle to my shoulder and firing a shot into the air. Then there was complete silence. Kevin comes to a halt right in the middle of the clearing on the property and turns around to look at me. I turn around and stare at him one more time before we both bolt onto the property and get out of there as quickly as the pickup truck we were driving can carry us. Since then, I haven't gone back to that location. On to the next one. Between Florence and Canyon City, Colorado, my family and myself were in Colorado on vacation. We were going down the Phantom Canyon between Florence and Canyon City, Colorado. We were probably five miles into the canyon when we made a curve in the road and I noticed out the right side of the car several cows standing around and a large black furry thing kind of bent a little in the knees walking around the cows. He looked maybe seven to eight feet tall. He was swinging his arms really fast, like he was trying to get away in a hurry. I never saw his face as he had his back to me. I was shocked at first and could not really say anything, but about five minutes later, I told my dad and he turned around and went back to the place where I had saw him. There was nothing there by then except the cows. We drove back a couple of miles and some people were camping, but they were packing up to leave. It was in the afternoon, maybe around 2 p.m. It was a beautiful clear day. The sun was shining and it was a little chilly. In the canyon, it's like a mountain on the other side and some places it is a large drop off. But, but where I saw him, I was only a few feet, maybe 50 feet from the road and the incline from the road was maybe two feet. There were trees, some large boulders, laying around places all over the canyon, really. And the only other things were grass and cows. My mom and dad did not believe me for a long time. But a few years later, that they had went back and had heard that someone else had seen such a thing around Colorado. And that something had tried to get into someone's house not far from there. And had found some fur on their back screen door. No one had ever really believed me, but a few years ago, I watched a special on Discovery Travel, and they had some researchers on there trying to track a Bigfoot sighting in Oklahoma. So I looked up Bigfoot sightings when I got to work today. It just seemed like we were not bothering it. That it was just trying to get somewhere else, kind of walking briskly, but not running. My mom and dad were in the front seat, and I was in the back. They were looking forward toward the mountain, and I was watching up the side of the car for any squirrels, rabbits, bears, mountain lion, or anything else I could see. My mom told me a few years later, after I had got married and moved away, that there had been some more sightings around Colorado. I don't remember where, and that on the back screen porch of an old shack lived in that they had found some fur, could not figure out if it was human or animal, On to the next one. Four of us were bow hunting in the Douglas Mountain area on private property. It was around 3 p.m. and my brother was bugling for elk on a hill about 500 yards away from us. Our younger sister was with him. Our dad and I were sitting in our vehicle and our dad began to bugle with my brother. The commotion got a response. We heard an eerie howling that was powerful. In a way, it sounded like a human trying to sound like an elk. The area we were in is miles from other roads and had no other hunters. Neither of us was making the noise. Our dad got out of the truck as the sound began to draw closer. He saw a dark brown flash of fur in the pinions and cedars. He thought it was an elk at first, but knew the color was wrong. We have hunted all of our lives and knew the sound was not that of an elk. 
When dad realized it wasn't an elk, he became very nervous and jumped back in the truck. When my brother and sister returned, we asked them if they had heard the same sound, and they said they didn't. The closest sounds that resembled this area are of the Bigfoot website. After the incident, we quickly drove out of the area, and we didn't return to hunt again. The witnesses had heard of a person seeing a hairy creature on a trail in the same general area. On to the next one. I lived in Las Animas County, Colorado, with my mother and stepfather in a canyon called San Miguel, which is located along the Ranch and Range on the Colorado-New Mexico border. We lived in a very remote area, behind Fisher's Peak near Trinidad, Colorado. I used to have to get up real early to get to school. It was daybreak, and our dog was outside barking hysterically. I had never heard her growl or act this way before or after this morning. She was looking into the canyon. I went to our kitchen window, which faced the canyon. I could see something running into the canyon. It was on two legs, tall and covered in hair. It didn't run like a man. It ran as if it was straddling a small rut side to side. I ran down the hall to my parents' room to wake them up so they could see what I was seeing. When they got to the window, it was gone. However, I saw it one last time as it passed between bushes. My parents were only witness to my extreme excitedness and my dog's hystericalness. It was daybreak, so the sun was just rising. It was approximately 5 to 6 a.m. He was in a clearing in a canyon. On to the next one. In Eagle County in Colorado, I was 17 and on a backpacking trip with my family in Grizzly Creek Canyon. It was night and we were sitting around the campfire talking. Suddenly, a foul smell came into the campsite. It smelled like a combination of rotten meat, body odor, and musk. Our dogs went crazy, barking and growling, staring past our campfire behind the tent. We could not see anything. Suddenly, we heard extremely loud and extremely close vocalizations coming from just the outside of the ring of light made by our fire. The sound was unlike anything we have ever heard before. It was not a mountain lion or an elk. It is hard to describe the sound. It was guttural, and it undulated and sounding like something that was strangling a goat. It vocalized two or three times. Each time the sound started, slow, and then built in intensity. My dad grabbed his gun, but didn't fire. After a few more minutes, the smell dissipated and the dog calmed down. I have never been more frightened in my life and remember wondering if I would live through the night. The next morning, we explored the area where we felt the sound were coming from. There was an area of smashed grass behind a large boulder approximately 15 to 20 feet from our tent, but nothing else significant. The whole day, I felt uneasy as if I were being watched or intruding. Earlier, we had taken a long hike downstream. After several hours of hiking, we came to a large clearing of flat rock that had jutted out over a fishing hole in the creek. The entire area of this clearing was littered with clothing, something very old that appeared to be from the 70s. Some of the clothes were in the trees and some were piled around the rock area. It was very creepy. The witnesses were four children, 17, 15, 13, and 7 years, mother and father, and two dogs, who were all sitting around a campfire at night. On earlier trip to the same area with my father, we found abandoned campsites where people left all of their gear, including backpacks and tents. My father and grandfather would both tell stories of having strange experiences there, including one incident of my father walking in the middle of the night to see someone standing over his sleeping bag. He was not in a tent. Thinking that it was one of the members of his group taking a bathroom break, he went back to sleep. After questioning his companions the next morning, that they did not leave their sleeping bags all night. 
When my grandfather would backpack there as a young man, he would describe what he called spirit, walking and hiding in the tall grass at night. On to the next one. Near Fort Carson at Cayenne Mountain near NORAD in El Paso County. While training at Fort Carson, I was on patrol with a Marine Recon Aggressor Force, aggressing fire batteries in simulated attacks. My patrol attacked the HQ company, and during the withdrawal, I was separated from my unit. There was plenty of ambient light, and I could see my unit across the field and hear them calling for me. They took off, and I figured I could cut through a wooded area and intercept them. As I rounded a bend in the trail, a figure stepped out into the trail in front of me. It was about six and a half feet tall, covered in light brown fur, had large fox-like ears, and large black globe-shaped eyes. The nostrils were slitted and large, without much nasal definition. The body was muscular, with a thin waist and easily discernible definition. The arms were long, hanging below the level of the hips. The creature stepped out into the trail, looking in the opposite direction, and I had stopped stock still the moment I saw it. It turned and saw me, at which it exhibited a startled reflex, then immediately crouched down and slowly moved sideways off the trail, watching me the entire time. It knelt behind a bush, at which point it became very hard to see. I remember that I was encountering something few people have the opportunity to see at only a distance of about 10 feet. It was around 3 a.m., nearly a full moon with a large amount of ambient light. On to the next one. My uncle was working the graveyard shift for a mine overlooking Cripple Creek, Colorado. He was out on his nightly rounds checking the ponds to make sure everything was still running the way it was supposed to. Some of the places he had to check are rather secluded. He finished checking one of the buildings where the equipment to keep the ponds up and running was. He locked the building and went around the side of the building to get in his truck when he saw the creature. My uncle stands six foot five and he weighed a good 220 pounds at the time. He ran back to the building, unlocked the door, and used the emergency phones they had in the building. I was 13 at the time, and I have never seen or heard my uncle cry. I am 29 now, and I have never seen or heard him cry since then. First, he called my grandfather and asked him to come and bring the gun, crying the whole time. We lived 40 miles away from where he was calling from, near Guffey. My mother and grandfather also worked for the mine, so they knew right where to go. My grandmother stayed on the phone with my uncle to try and keep him calm. He just kept repeating, it wasn't a bear. Oh my God, it was huge. Is Pa coming? He spoke to my mother and grandfather about it. My grandfather said he was on drugs, so he didn't speak about it very much after that. I'm very close to my uncle, as is my mother. We are the only ones he has ever spoke to about it again. At the time, he was 22 and afraid of nothing. Growing up where we did, we knew what a bear looked like, as well as all the other wildlife in the area, except for the thing he saw that night. When he spoke of it, he said it was on two legs and taller than any animal he had ever seen. I tried to get him to send this to you, but he doesn't like to talk about it. He starts shaking every time he does. On to the next one. In Green Mountain Falls in El Paso and Teller Counties in Colorado, Dan Mises happened to look out his window to see these creatures running down the road in front of his house, which at one point is 30 feet from the Mises' home. The whole road was covered with about a quarter of an inch of fresh, cold snow that had fallen. They ran down the road in a matter with their arms hanging down in a swinging in a pendulum motion. Mises perceived an impression that the creatures were covered with hair. 
Persons that followed the tracks in the snow swore they vanished in mid-stride. There were several older reports of similar creatures in the same area around Pike National Forest. On to the next one. Two friends and myself were returning to Colorado from Texas by car. At just before midnight, on a dark stretch of Interstate 25, heading north towards Denver, just a hundred of miles before Colorado Springs, Colorado, something strange caught my eye. I was seated in the passenger side of the car. A friend, Trent, was driving. In the back seat, asleep and extremely ill, was another friend. To the right, traveling at 60 miles per hour, the headlights caught what appeared to be a three to four foot white haired ape like creature with a dark face. It was standing upright. My eyes caught it for some 100 feet ahead in the light, and I followed it with my eyes. It was merely standing at the side of the road. Although I admit a childhood interest in Bigfoot lore, I almost instantly dismissed it as such a creature. Surely, my eyes were playing tricks on me. I said nothing to my friend who was driving. My first instinct was to ask my friend to turn around and go back to investigate. Instead, I said nothing. Five minutes later, my friend pulled off to the side of the road as he had to relieve himself. We met at the back of the car to take care of business, where he expressed he was getting tired. I agreed, telling him I too was tired and was starting to see things. He then told me that he was also seeing things, saying, yeah, I just thought I saw a polar bear back there. A chill went up my spine, and I asked him if it was white and furry. He said yes. I told him that I thought I saw a small white ape with a dark face. Without missing a beat, he told me to get in the car. Let's get out of here. We wanted to go back to investigate, but our sick friend in the back seat needed to get home due to his illness. He was passed out throughout the entire episode, and we didn't want to pester him with our shared illusion. We're obviously unsure of what we saw. However, we agreed that it was not a coyote, and we both only saw two legs. This account was dismissed by us until five years later when Unsolved Mysteries did a feature on some unusual sightings of a large Bigfoot-like creature. The report along the Colorado Front Range, there had been reports of a white-haired ape-like creature roaming around the homes and foothills just north of Colorado Springs. Our sighting was 100 some miles south. I think it important to mention, for credibility, that I have held a strong fascination in Bigfoot lore since childhood. I am not totally convinced that what I saw was what I know as a Bigfoot. The account is true, however. I believe circumstances of the event and the account in that region are interesting and worth reporting here. I have never told this event to more than a half dozen people. The environment of the exact place along I-25 would be difficult to assess due to the time of day. It was 11 p.m. to midnight. We could speculate that this stretch of highway would be some six miles east of the front range of the Rocky Mountains. On to the next one. In Hillsdale County in Colorado, what we saw was a very large creature, at least seven feet tall and approximately 350 pounds, with very long arms and took very long steps as he crossed along a grassy slope. He stopped at a small group of pines at the edge of a sheer bluff over Cabola Creek. We each had scopes and binoculars and watched him for several minutes. My brother-in-law had the best optics and was able to see his face. He saw white hair around its eyes and mouth and said the eyes were yellow-orange. We each had cameras in our packs, but were too stunned to remember them. The creature went to the edge and jumped. He was never more than 300 yards on a very clear day in short grass. This sighting was in Gunnison or Hinsdale County, Colorado. On about October, we had not begun our hunt as we were still backpacking in. I wish now we would have contacted someone since we had it in a vulnerable spot. 
I've also thought maybe it had a den there in the rock. The area is on public land. It's in the Powderhorn Primitive Area. There are no roads and no vehicles allowed. It's northeast of Lake City and south of Powderhorn. We crossed Cabola Creek at the Gujan Ranch and followed a trail up to about 11,000 feet in elevation, just east of Fish Canyon. We met it bordering our way and below us. It did not run, but did increase its gait. I have been back there twice since then and found one large barefoot track in a dry, dusty trail, as well as large rocks freshly stacked on one another, with the ground under them freshly scratched in. I have seen where bear have done this, but did not stack them. I also found a small grove of young aspen trees that were broken off at five feet, and the tips of the twigs were eaten. On to the next one. I thought I would share a true story with you involving my grandfather and a Bigfoot encounter that happened in the early 1940s and again in the 1950s and 60s. My family is from the Forkland region of Western Boyle County near Mitchellburg. This part of the country has thousands of acres of timberland and large hills we call knobs. Even today, this area of Kentucky has areas that are not habitable due to rugged terrain. My grandfather died in the late 1970s, having lived into his 80s, and I heard him tell this story many, many times. In rural Kentucky in the 1940s, work and money were nearly non-existent, and with him having young children to feed, it was necessary to hunt for wild game or deer for food. One afternoon while hunting in a valley along the North Rolling Fork in an area called Scrub Grass, he told of pushing through some wild willows growing along the banks of North Rolling Fork to find an animal across the stream standing on two feet and covered head to toe with black hair. Grandpa said the animal appeared to be young, standing only about three feet in height, muscular in build. He said the animal's face wasn't distinguishable due to hair covering it. The animal did not appear to be frightened and stood motionless. Grandpa was so taken aback by the sight of this animal, he said his first reaction was to shoot, but he doubted his ammo. Being more suited for small game, he wasn't sure if it would bring the animal down and that he feared two things, that the animal might charge towards him or that there may be more of these things just out of sight in the willow thicket that grew along both sides of the stream. So he very slowly backed away from the animal and back into the willows behind him and then ran, hoping that the animal would not follow him. The next morning, Grandpa took the men back to the area where he had the encounter to find numerous human-looking footprints of various sizes and on the sandbar along the bank of the stream. Grandpa knew the forest well and always believed the animals migrated like birds at certain times of the year. He believed these animals sometimes slept in the trees and on numerous hunting trips he told of seeing them swing from treetop to treetop. When food was scarce due to drought, he believed missing chickens in the night or torn off screens to a smokehouse was these animals pillaging for food. As a child, sitting on the front porch with my grandpa on a hot fall evening in the early 1950s and 60s after sundown, we would hear wailing sounds deep in the forest and Grandpa would tell Grandma to take his kids inside. The area has many residents now, and I moved away long ago. But I would imagine once the sun goes down, at certain times of the year, these animals could easily slip through the woods undetected by anyone other than maybe a barking dog or two. I was walking through my neighborhood, Bluegrass Estates, Wright Creature Witness Dakota Paw, 
which is next to a large farm. I looked over, and about 30 yards away, there was a hairy, black creature about eight feet tall, staring at me with coal black eyes. The sighting took place near Danville, Kentucky, in January. It stared at me for about 35 seconds, the witness claimed, then turned and ran away. On to the next one. A huge, hairy, man-like creature was seen in Bracken County in August. Grant, a local deer hunter, claims to have encountered it at 6.30 a.m. that morning in the woods of rural Augusta, Kentucky. I was squirrel hunting that Sunday morning and was sitting on the hill, he states. I heard the movement over on the other side of the hill and he walked up. Grant described the beast as eight feet tall, heavily built and covered in wet, dark reddish brown hair. The reason he called the thing he was because its genitals were hanging out of its hair. Grant says the creature didn't see him at first when he approached it to within 20 yards. The startled witness held up his rifle and shot up in the air to scare him. I didn't want to shoot him because I didn't think my 22 could kill him and I didn't want a pissed off Bigfoot attacking me. The creature let out huge gorilla-like sounds, Grant claimed, stared right at him for a few seconds, then ran the other way. He could add no further details other than the creature's eyes were covered by hair. On to the next one. In September, Bigfoot put an appearance in Brethitt County. The creature was claimed to be around eight feet tall, with a slightly human-looking hair-covered face. It fled into the woods when the witness stepped outside to investigate. The thing's mournful vocalizations have allegedly been heard by area residents on many occasions over the years and were said to sound like something from the pits of hell. Breathitt, like many other Kentucky counties, both near and far, has a history of reported monster activity. On to the next one. Over in Hazard, a large, hairy, upright critter was seen crossing the road one night in front of startled motorists. Years earlier in January, small, barefoot, childlike footprints were discovered crossing a frozen creek in Jackson, Kentucky. No human children were reported missing from the area. A man named Kenneth White, while constructing cattle stalls under a large, overhanging rock ledge near his home, came upon the perfectly preserved skeletal remains of what he first thought to be a Native American, as it was buried facing east. A well-known Native American custom. Noticing some atypical aspects of the burial, White asked Henderson, a well-known Kentucky writer and folklorist to help further examine the strange bones, which were covered with a peculiar white powdery substance that disappeared when touched. Upon reassembling the bones, the two were amazed to find that the unusual fellow in life had stood at least eight feet nine inches tall. Moreover, the arms were abnormally long with large hands, while the feet of the being seemed small by comparison. The skull measured an astounding 30 inches in circumference, just six inches shy of a full yard. But the most unusual aspect of the skeleton was the facial structure, the likes of which neither had ever before seen or even heard of. The eye and nose sockets were slits rather than cavities, and the area where the jawbone hinges to the skull was solid bone. Seemingly, this creature had never been able to open its mouth to eat or speak. No weapons, tools, or clothing remains were found in association with the bones, which, according to Henderson's account, occupied a position five feet below the ground, indicating that they had been placed there at least 300 years prior to their discovery. Strangely, Henderson related that the burial site looked only a few days old, with no sign of dark-colored soil, 
usually associated with the decaying of human tissue. The two assumed the remains were those of an extraordinarily large deformed man. In the same area, some 20 years prior, a 60-pound double-edged stone axe and a 20-inch long flint knife blade were plowed up by a local farmer. White later reburied the peculiar bones and no official examination of them was ever conducted. Henderson died in March of 1995 without ever disclosing the exact location of the burial site. Another early account, as recorded by Henderson, comes from Bragg County. In 1935, three trappers, James Collin, Wilgus Pratter, and Dale Carpenter, were out checking a trap line they had lain in a remote section of Quicksand Creek when they found that all of their traps had been sprung but were empty. Every single animal had either escaped, been freed, or was stolen from the trap. This was mighty perplexing to them. So, the three men decided to stake out a large stretch of line overnight to find out what was happening to the traps and kill the animal responsible. They rebaited the traps and, later that evening, stationed themselves about 300 feet apart beneath a long, rocky overhang where most of their catches had been lost and began their vigil. They all agreed to signal the others if they saw anything with a single gunshot. That night passed without incident, as did the second night of surveillance. But their patience was rewarded when, at about 1 a.m. on the third night, Pratter saw a figure quietly approaching the trap line. It was walking upright in the moonlight, and as it approached nearer to his position beneath the ledge, apparently unaware of his presence there, Pratter saw it was a large, hairy, man-like animal. Hardly believing his eyes, Pratter waited until the creature was within 20 feet of him, then raised his 30-30 rifle and pumped three shots straight into the thing. At the sound of the first shot, both Collins and Carpenter hurried to join their friend. They arrived just in time to hear whatever Pratter had shot as it thrashed around in the thick brush. They then approached to within what they thought was 25 feet of the animal making these sounds and opened fire. Between the three of them, they reportedly fired off 20 bullets in the direction of the thrashing sounds, after which all was quiet and still. The beast was likely dead, they reasoned. They hadn't heard anything running away from the area. Even so, they decided to wait until daylight before entering the woods to search for its body. At dawn, the party searched the area but found nothing. No tracks, no blood, and no trail. Nothing to indicate that the creature had ever really been there at all. These men were honest, sober woodsmen, Henderson stated, who did not relate their experience until much later. All three were expert shot and swore until they died that they had fired over 20 rounds at a huge, hairy animal at a distance of less than five yards without killing or apparently even hitting it. Henderson, without a doubt, believed in the existence of Bigfoot. His own grandfather, father, and uncles had encountered one back in 1910, which no doubt left quite an impression on him. The four men had gathered at Henderson's huge four-room log cabin to play poker one rainy, gloomy Friday night in October of that year, when a violent thunderstorm struck. The rain pelted the cabin, and the wind seemed intent on pushing down the very walls. The game wore on, though, as the lightning flashed outside the windows and the thunder boomed above their heads. Suddenly, from outside, there came a blood-curdling high-pitched scream, the likes of which they'd never heard before, and, though alarming, that it nearly paralyzed the entire group. There was only one thing to do. They immediately grabbed up their shotguns and thus, armed, raced out into the storm in the direction of the scream. As they neared a field close to the house, the flashes of lightning revealed a huge, white, hairy figure standing there in the darkness. Nearly simultaneously, all four men raised their shotguns and fired. What happened next was completely unexpected 
and no doubt the source of much conjecture and debate for many years afterward. Instead of falling to the ground dead from gunshot wound as anything else would have done, the large white figure seemed to just evaporate right before their eyes. Stunned by what they just witnessed, the Henderson family walked over to where the creature was standing, but they could find nothing there. The next morning, after the storm had passed, they went back to the field to look for any sign of what they had shot the previous night. Much to Henderson's alarm, they found four of his prize hogs lying dead in a heap near the spot. On examination, it appeared that most of the bones in their bodies had been cruelly broken and their throats had been cut as if with a knife. Perhaps even more curious, if possible, was the complete absence of blood at the scene. Another rainy night, this time several weeks later, offered the men one opportunity to discover the true nature of the critter, and this time they were ready when they heard that awful scream issue once again from the field outside. They rushed out to the field, and staying close together, began to search for the source of the alarming vocalization. They walked a good distance out into the field when they saw the same white figure as before. It seemed not to know that the men were near, or if it did, was completely ignoring them. This time, all four men took careful aim at the creature. Again, four shotguns blasted out a hail of lead that would kill anything. The beast let out another unearthly scream and vanished into thin air once again. Now, there was no doubt whatsoever about the ghostly nature of the creature. Nothing natural could have survived the veritable hail of bullets they'd unleashed upon it. The next day, they returned and found another hog in the exact same condition as the previous one, lying in the exact spot where the creature had stood. They also found several deep three-toed footprints, which they could never explain. According to Henderson, the white Bigfoot creature was never seen or heard there again. According to investigator, the late Mary Green, a lone motorist, saw Bigfoot in his headlights on the night of November. On a night in November, while driving through Hazard, Kentucky, the witness claimed that he saw an eight to nine foot tall hairy beast as it crossed the road in front of him at around 7 p.m. that evening. He described it as a cross between a monkey and a bear with very dark colored fur. It made sounds like that of a very big bear, he said. After he arrived at the spot, claiming that he stopped the car and got out to investigate, only to find a line of footprints some 20 inches in length along the roadside. On to the next one. I spent over 40 years of my life as a hunting guide in Alaska. I was born and raised in Fairbanks, but I retired in Colorado to be near my kids, who all left Alaska and never went back, other than to visit. Seems like they didn't care for the endless winter nights back home. After my parents had passed away, I left Fairbanks and moved down to Soldotna on the Kenai, guiding out of there. I liked Fairbanks, but most of my clients wanted to hunt the big coastal brown bears, and the Kenai was closer to the places I guided, which included Kodiak Island. Well, when this event I'm about to relate happened, things were slow, or I never would have taken these guys out. It was during the recession, and I was feeling kind of desperate, but I have only myself to blame, as I had a bad hunch from the start and ignored it. These two guys were true Chicagos, not one ounce of sourdough in either of them. If I'd known then what I knew at the end of the trip, I would have never, in a million years, agreed to guide them. Anyway, here I was with two greenhorns from, you would expect to hear they were from Chicago or some big city, but no, these guys were from Idaho. I think that's partly why I didn't listen to my gut. How bad can two guys from Idaho be? 
I mean, there are lots of bears there and lots of hunting. Why they didn't just stay home and hunt is beyond me. Well, actually, I do know. They wanted to brag about hunting the big Kodiaks in Alaska. I'll tell you, some of my best clients have been from the big cities. These guys are aware that they don't know much and will listen to you. They respect your knowledge and expertise. They're easy to guide and are really happy to be in Alaska, whether they get a bear or not. They value the experience. These two guys were the opposite. At one point, I asked them why they'd even bothered to hire me since they already knew it all. They just laughed. We all knew they had hired me because if you're not an Alaskan, you can't hunt for Kodiak bears unless you have a licensed Alaskan guide along. Okay, we were now going to Kodiak. It's no minor task to hunt in Kodiak, and the number of licenses there are very restricted. Kodiak bears are in limited supply, and Alaska game and fish won't let them be overhunted. It's considered a unique privilege to hunt them, and it's not cheap. I don't remember exactly what I charged these guys, but it was a lot. I have friends up there who still guide, and they tell me it typically costs over $20,000 per person to be guided in Kodiak Island. That doesn't include a bunch of other fees, like licenses and hiring a float plane. You have to have a float plane to get you and your gear to Kodiak, and they charge by the pound. If you're a big guy with lots of gear, you'll pay more. It's usually around $500 an hour for a 1,000 pounds, including you. If you decide to go in by boat, you're looking at about the same price per person per day. It's not cheap. On top of all that, the hunting season only lasts for about six weeks in the spring and fall. And once you pull your license and are on the ground, you have only two weeks to get your bear. Then you have to come out regardless. Well, we went out in the fall, late October, primarily because these guys wanted the big full coats the bears have then. The main problem with fall hunting is that the days are shorter and the bears start denning up. But one good thing is that the mosquitoes are pretty much gone. There are a ton of rules when hunting Kodiak brownies. And as the guide, you'd better know them all, which I did. One such rule was no night hunting or using night vision scopes. Okay, on with the story. There are a number of methods employed to hunt bears one being to hoof it to a likely spot, then set up a windbreak or shelter, hiding and scoping for movement, kind of letting the bear come to you. The Kodiak grizzly is the largest carnivore in North America, and they're generally easy to spot. They can be up to 10 feet tall and weigh 1,500 pounds. When you're on the ground like that, you have to always be aware of the wind direction and move into it so the bear won't smell you. One problem with sitting and waiting for a bear to come to you is that the wind will change, advertising your location to every critter out there. My hunt had a real high success rate, and the reason was that I moved my hunters around instead of waiting for the bears, which meant we could change directions when the winds did. How did I do this? By Zodiac Raft. In the fall, we floated the rivers and bogs and almost always came upon bears eating late spawning salmon or berries. We moved fast enough that they usually didn't have an opportunity to smell us. So, these two yahoos arrived in the Anchorage airport, where my wife picked them up. When I saw them, they looked like two rats just fresh off a barge after a long trip at sea. I kind of felt sorry for them, as they said, they'd both gotten airsick on the way. This worried me, as we still had to fly to Kodiak. If you can get airsick in a big jet, there wasn't much hope in a small plane. At least it would be a relatively short trip, I thought. I took them down to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to get their licenses. 
this set the clock to ticking on the two-week window, so I hoped to get to the Kodiak that same day. I'd already hired a float plane to get us and our gear there. We drove back out to the airport, where I left them in the care of my wife, who was plying them with hot coffee and cinnamon rolls. With the help of the pilot, a friend of mine, I loaded our gear into the float plane, including the inflatable Zodiac raft. I then jumped in, and in a couple of hours, we were flying low over one of Kodiak Island's many small bays. The island is mountainous and heavily forested in the northeast, where I guided with many deep bays that provide good anchorage for boats. We landed and unloaded the gear, dragging it up onto the beach. My plan was that I would stay with the gear. When I had just one client, I would usually fly back with the pilot after making sure the gear had plenty of red flagging on it so we could find it again. But with two clients, it was better to stay and not overload the plane. I always planned for the worst and assumed it would take the full two weeks to get a bear. Besides the Zodiac, I had plenty of freeze-dried food, which I liked because it was portable and didn't smell until opened. I also had a stove, water, and filter, sleeping bags, and a couple of good canvas tents that would withstand the heavy winds so well known on the island. I even had a couple of smaller, lightweight nylon tents in case we decided to leave our base camp and make a spike camp which I would only do if we were having no luck hunting from the raft. All this, along with other survival gear and a small engine for running upstream, made for a heavy load. Our gear also included three thirty-eight mag rifles with waterproof rifle stocks and plenty of ammo, as well as six cans of bear spray. The cans almost seemed like an afterthought next to all the other gear, but bear spray has saved my life before, and I consider it to be the most important thing in all that gear. You're not supposed to have it in planes with pressurized cabins, but a float plane was okay. As I watched the pilot leave, skimming across the water, I suddenly felt a sense of isolation that was almost overpowering. I'd felt it before, but this particular time, it seemed much stronger than usual. It was so disturbing that it made me start thinking about retiring, which I actually did shortly afterward. I don't know, maybe what my pilot friend had told me on the flight over had an effect. He'd said the Kodiak bears had been especially aggressive that summer, and several had even come into a couple of the native towns and torn things up, as well as destroying a few hunting camps. The natives were saying that the bears were angry at all the people coming in and disturbing their home. A couple of bear viewing businesses had started up that year, so I assumed that's what they were talking about. I hadn't guided a Kodiak hunt since the spring, so it was all news to me. Well, I'm not sure what time it was, but it had to be around 2 p.m. when the pilot left. I expected the two Idaho guys to arrive in about four hours, which gave me plenty of time. Even though it was now fall, the days were still long enough to do what needed to be done. I would set up the tents on the beach, gather some wood, then when they arrived, make some dinner. We could sit around a campfire for a couple of hours, then fall into our sleeping bags. I suspected they would be really tired, I normally would set to it and get everything sorted out, pitch the tents, and make sure everything was ready before kicking back and waiting. But for some reason, I felt like sitting there on a log for a while. I felt a sense of uncertainty, not at all my normal feeling of competence. As I sat there, I thought about all the years I'd been doing this. I'd always liked Kodiak Island. There was something really special about its big trees and the vast solitude they encompassed, as well as the blue inlets and fjords. It evoked a feeling that I imagined was similar to what the first people to cross the Bering Strait felt when they viewed Alaska. 
It felt rugged and raw and untouched, like the ends of the earth. I watched as another float plane flew overhead, probably taking in another guide and his clients. I normally wouldn't like to see anyone, but the plane felt comforting for some reason. A touch of civilization, I guess. I finally got up and started gathering wood, making a big pile near where I then pitched the two tents, my tent, away from the other. I had too many clients who snored to want to sleep close together. Bears or no bears, I then organized the gear, pulling a big tarp across everything and tying it securely to some shrubs in case winds came in during the night. Kodiak Island sits on the northwest corner of the Gulf of Alaska, which is a breeding ground for big storms. High winds and harsh weather are common, and I always carried a shortwave radio to check the weather reports. Everything was ready. I sat back down on the log, watching the small waves lapping against the beach. It was almost hypnotic, and I realized I was tired. I had no idea what time it was, but I knew it was getting late. Where was that float plane? I was beginning to worry. Finally, it was dark enough that I knew the plane couldn't come in, and I knew something must be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time I'd had clients arrive late, usually because of bad weather or some kind of mechanical problem. In a way, I was kind of glad as long as nothing serious was wrong, as it gave me a night to myself. I'd taken up guiding because I loved the outdoors, but it seemed like I was usually too busy with all the things that go with guiding to ever really enjoy being out. I was tired, but something was making me uncomfortable enough that I decided to build a fire. When I'm out alone, I rarely build fires, as they announce to everyone where I am, and I prefer to be in stealth mode when out by myself. But that night, a fire seemed like the nicest thing in the world. So I built a big one, almost a bonfire. I sat close to it, the warmth feeling good, both physically and mentally. After eating a freeze-dried beef stroganoff dinner, I sat there for what seemed like hours, watching the wood slowly burn itself into red twinkling coals. Finally, too tired to stay up, I poured water on the coals and crawled into my tent. I was soon fast asleep. For someone who had just been feeling uncomfortable about his surroundings, I sure slept hard. It seemed like it must be dawn when I finally woke up, and I thought I could hear someone whistling. Had the float plane come in? I poked my head out the tent fly and realized it was still too dark for a plane to land. I could barely see the first hint of daylight through the trees behind me. I crawled back into my bag, not wanting to deal with the chill. The fall season in Kodiak is October 25th to November 30th, and that time of year, it gets downright cold with temperatures falling as low as zero. It felt like it was below freezing. As I scrunched down into my bag, I heard it again. Someone was whistling. It had an eerie quality to it. Maybe it was the people in the other plane I'd seen yesterday. As I listened, I realized the eerie quality came from a hollowness. The whistle was low and hollow and very loud. It had to be some kind of instrument and I then figured some of the Kodiak natives were around. Maybe someone from Larson Bay was out on a boat. It was an incredible sunrise, and soon I heard the distinct whine of an airplane coming in, and the float plane soon landed. One of the guys had gotten seriously airsick when they tried to fly out the previous day, and the pilot had turned back, thus the delay. The two fellows from Idaho were quickly on the beach taking photos as the plane turned and floated back out on the bay and took off. I don't know why I didn't listen to my gut, because it was telling me, no, it wasn't telling me, it was shouting at me, saying, go on with the plane, cancel the trip and leave. Of course, it seemed foolish to even consider that, given the cost of the float plane and the fact we'd have to haul all the gear out 
Not to mention, I'd have to reimburse all those big bucks to my clients. I guess I could have said I was sick or something, but I'm not that kind of guy. Once I make a commitment, I honor it. We spent the morning siding in our guns with me making sure they knew the basics. I had them practice shooting from several positions as I wanted to know their capabilities as well as making sure they understood the ballistics of their rifles, as these were not their own personal guns. Of course, we made a lot of noise, and I was sure the natives I'd heard whistling earlier were long gone. We finally had some lunch, then inflated the Zodiac with my little portable compressor and got it all set up with the outboard motor and some supplies and survival gear. We would cruise around the area some while I taught them what they needed to know to hunt Kodiaks in Alaska, then come back to our base camp for the night. I didn't expect to get very far, but it was important to orient them to the area and make sure they knew the basic safety requirements for hunting grizzlies, such as how to use bear spray. As we floated out into the bay, I glanced back at our camp. I swore I saw someone there, but when I looked again, they were gone. This didn't sit well with me, and I wondered if someone were going to steal my gear, which was basically unheard of on Kodiak Island. I motored up a ways into a small inlet that turned into a river, all the while telling the guys about bears and what to expect. While they used binoculars to scan the countryside, I didn't really expect to see much since we were making so much noise, but this was just a recon trip anyways. I finally pulled over on the shore, where we got out and climbed a small hill, then motionless with spotting scopes, scanning the places where brown bears were likely to be seen, such as south-facing hillsides and openings in thick, brushy areas. So far, the two guys had been congenial and thoughtful, so I had no idea what was to come. As we sat there watching for suspicious-looking dark spots, or odd-shaped bushes or logs, I thought I saw movement in the periphery of my vision. Turning, I was certain something had quickly slipped behind a distant tree line, as if it had seen me look towards it. From nowhere, the feeling I'd had the previous night hit me. I felt very strange. I almost felt as if I were being stalked, and yet I had no evidence of such just a couple of unusual things, for the thought to even cross my mind was odd, as I'm not paranoid, especially when carrying a 338 mag rifle. It was getting on towards evening, so we gathered everything up and went back down to the Zodiac, where we took off and were soon back at our base camp. The day had gone well, and my two clients seemed happy, especially after dinner. My wife had sent in some big, thick steaks for our first dinner out, and I baked some potatoes in the coals to go with them. Afterwards, we all sat around the fire, the guys listening when I told them bear stories. Some of the stories were kind of hairy, and I even told a few tales of guys getting killed, though it was a relatively rare occurrence and hadn't happened to any of my clients. I later wondered what had gotten into me, as I typically would never do something like that, worrying that I might taint the trip. Guides can sometimes get pretty big tips if the client has a good trip, so I never wanted to do anything worrisome. If they heard weird noises in the night, I would be the one to suffer, as they'd be in my tent, wanting me to take care of things. Well, as luck would have it, they did come to my tent in the middle of the night waking me and wanting to know why I'd been throwing rocks at them. I was irritated that they would wake me up for such nonsense, as I knew they were making it all up. I got my big spotlight out and shined it around their tent, and sure enough, there were several big rocks nearby, and one that had hit the tent square on, ripping a small hole. They finally convinced me that they were telling the truth, primarily because I could tell they were scared to death. I made up a story about how the natives would sometimes do that to try and scare people off, though I'd never heard of such a thing. But that seemed to placate them, 
if not make them somewhat angry. Truth be told, I had no idea who would be throwing rocks in the middle of the night way out here in the middle of nowhere. It was very strange. We all finally went back to bed. Well, at least I did, and I found out later they stayed up the rest of the night watching with their night vision scopes and drinking. Since guns and alcohol don't mix, I don't allow drinking on my expeditions and make that clear up front. So, when I got up the next morning and found them passed out with a couple of whiskey bottles nearby, I wasn't a happy camper, to say the least. But, given the strangeness of the previous night, I decided I would overlook it this time. Since early morning is the best time to hunt, I woke them in spite of their protest. While they drank coffee, I got things organized and ready for the day. By then, I was ready to get a bear so I could get out of there. I was mad that they'd been drinking, and the odd things that were going on were starting to make me skittish. Since most brown bears begin entering dens by early November, I was hoping we could get into an area where a bear was denning up and catch it unawares. Bears will generally choose steep slopes at higher elevations for their dens, so I had a nearby area in mind, one where we could motor upstream a few miles, then tie up and hike a couple more miles into an area with some good topography. They were fairly ready, and as we got into the Zodiac, something in the mud on the beach caught my eye. It was a set of two tracks, unlike anything I'd ever seen, kind of like one a barefoot person would leave if standing in one spot, but much larger. The tracks sank into the mud several inches and were washed out looking. What puzzled me was that they were the only tracks on the beach other than our own. How could someone leave just one set of tracks? Then it dawned on me that it was possible only if they'd been swimming and stopped long enough to stand up in the shallow water as the tide was going out. My two clients didn't see the tracks, and I wasn't about to point them out. No reason to add any more fuel to what had already gone on. I decided that someone had boated up to our camp while we were gone, and got out for a minute, and their tracks were large because the water had distorted them. I started the motor and was ready to take off when something occurred to me. What if whoever was messing around with us came into our camp while we were gone? I stepped back out of the raft and went back to the tent, grabbing a dry bag and putting some freeze-dried food into it, as well as our water filter and a few other items, including the lightweight tents, a solar lantern, and my portable one-burner Coleman stove. We now had enough survival gear with us that we could make it for a while if need be. Why are we taking all this stuff? One of the guys asked. Just in case, I replied, which really didn't answer his question, but he didn't question it. Both guys were acting pretty subdued, as if they were feeling under the weather. It was an uneventful day, and we didn't even see a bear, let alone shoot one. I was disappointed as I really wanted to get a bear and go home, but I guess I was going to have to earn my keep on this one. It was late when we floated back to the beach where our base camp sat, and I didn't bother to unload anything from the raft, just tying it up to a nearby rock. After a dinner of freeze-dried spaghetti, the talk turned from the day's activity to my wondering aloud why we hadn't even seen a bear. There were days when no bears were around, but it was unusual to not at least see one in the far distance. And as I thought more about it, I realized we hadn't seen any wildlife at all, not even a moose or a river otter. Come to think of it, we hadn't even seen a bird. I thought about stories I'd read about animals leaving an area prior to an earthquake. Kodiak was definitely in Earthquake Central, the thing was, we'd been out all day and hadn't seen anything, and from what I'd read, animals exhibited erratic behavior minutes before a quake, not days. I decided it was all coincidental and went to bed, leaving the pair to sit by the fire talking. 
I suspected they would soon be drinking, but I didn't care, as long as they put the fire out when they went to bed. My attitude was getting worse and worse, and I really didn't know why. Things felt bleak. I had just drifted into a nice, deep sleep when I suddenly awoke to the smell of smoke and what sounded like drunken yelling. Poking my head out of the tent, I could see our campfire was spreading to the edge of the beach where lots of brush and undergrowth fed into the deep forest. And even though Kodiak Island typically gets a lot of rain, this had been a dry season. Things were ready to rock and roll with just one match. I slipped my boots on and jumped from the tent. Just then, I heard gunfire and could see one of the Idaho guys shooting into the forest. Why would anyone shoot blindly into the forest? My first thought was to try to put the fire out. I yelled at the two guys to help me out, but they instead ran the opposite direction toward the raft, yelling something about bears. I tried to stomp out the fire, but it had quickly spread and was soon in the brush, which quickly caught fire with flames crackling and shooting upwards. I was amazed at how quickly the fire moved into the trees. There was nothing I could do to stop it. My next thought was to save as much gear as possible. None of it was cheap, especially the tents, and I yelled at the two guys for help, but they disappeared. I was beyond mad, and I guess my anger helped fuel my actions as I quickly had both tents down, wadded into bundles around the poles, with the sleeping bags wrapped around them. It was all too cumbersome to carry very efficiently, but I soon had part of the gear over by the raft. I went back for the rest of it, but it was too late, as the fire had caught the nearby grasses and was soon almost underfoot. It was time to flee jump into the raft and get out into the water. I started to drag the tent into the raft, but the raft seemed to be missing. Surely, I had overlooked it in the dark, I thought in a panic, shining my headlamp around. But no, it was gone. The rope that I'd used to tie it to a rock was still there, but someone had cut the raft free. I, of course, knew who that someone was. My courageous client. I had begun to suspect they were nothing but trouble. But I was shocked to find they lacked such integrity that they would leave me stranded in front of an oncoming fire. It was unbelievable. But what was even more unbelievable was what I saw when I turned around. There, not more than 30 feet away, were two shadowy figures coming my way from the forest. I at first thought they were my Idaho clients and wondered where the raft had gone. But... I soon realized they were too large and bulky to be humans. My second thought was that the fire had pushed out two really big Kodiak bears who were now coming straight towards me. I knew wildlife was typically not predatory when under these kind of stressors, but there was nothing to keep them from coming after me anyway. I then realized I'd left my gun in the tent, so it had to be all wrapped up in the melee of tents and sleeping bags. I had about two seconds to wonder how I could have been so careless and absent-minded. Then the dark shadows rushed right by me and into the water, swimming out to sea, soon gone. Bears are good swimmers and will often swim across rivers and lakes without much thought. But I knew these weren't bears. No Kodiak has ever gotten that large. They must have weighed in at close to 2,000 pounds each. Can you even picture how large an animal that weighs that much is? It's mind-boggling. I'd heard rumors of the hairy men on Kodiak for years, but nobody I knew had ever seen one, so I figured it was just that. Rumors. But now I knew better. All of a sudden, the whistling, the tracks, the figure I'd seen in camp, and also along the tree line. Well, it all made sense now. How could I have been so clueless? The heat from the fire was now so intense that I had no choice but to follow the shadows into the water, and I can't tell you how scary that was. I pulled off my boots and dog paddled out about 50 feet, hoping the current wouldn't pull me out to sea. Luckily, the tide was coming in, so I had more trouble staying out than being pulled away. 
I treaded water there for I don't know how long, as the fire gradually retreated, having burned itself out along the beach, now burning back into the interior of the forest. I slowly let the tide pull me back onto the beach where I lay for a while in exhaustion. As I lay there, I could see the figures had also returned. They must have been doing the same thing I did, biding their time waiting at the fire. I badly wanted to get back over to my tent and gun, but the ground was too hot to walk on except for where it was wet. I realized later when it was daylight that everything had burned. All that was left of my rifle was the barrel. My other two guns also burned, having been left behind by the Idaho guys in their run for safety. The two huge figures stood looking at me, and the strange feeling I'd had earlier returned. I knew I was in the presence of something that could kill me as easily as I could swat a fly. I stood my ground at raging Kodiak bears, but this felt different. It made me feel very humble and small. After what felt like forever, the figures turned and walked away, crossing the still smoldering ground and disappearing into a part of the forest the fire hadn't touched. I don't know how long I sat there on the beach, too exhausted to be afraid. Finally, after what seemed like forever, the sun began to rise. I wondered where my two clients were, I can't tell you where I hoped they were, as it would make me look uncharitable. I was lucky, and it wasn't long before a float plane came over and saw me, landing on the water and rescuing me. I won't go into all the details, but the two guys from Idaho ended up on a beach far from the fire, totally lost, where they sat it out for three days, waiting for help, scared to death, the entire time with no guns, Fortunately for them, they had plenty of survival gear. I guess I was glad I hadn't unloaded the raft, though at that point, I was half hoping they'd float on over to Japan or Hawaii or something. They were eventually rescued by the Coast Guard, and after my testimony, their return trip included a visit to state troopers where they faced charges for starting the fire, which eventually burned several hundred acres. They were eventually fined thousands of dollars, and last I heard, were also facing a lawsuit from the state. I retired not long after that, but I still lived in Anchorage for a while, and would occasionally fly with my pilot friend over Kodiak, just to see what was there. He knew my story, and was as eager as I was to find some evidence of the hairy guys, but we never did see any. But then... We never saw any Kodiak bears from the air either, and we all know they're there. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!